So the food is vegetarian? Yeah, pure vegetarian, pure sacred food. And that's... When you take the food, you can feel very happy and uh, you don't be angry. Hmm? Ranjan is a Brahmin priest of the medieval Ananta Garudev temple in Babeneshwar, eastern India. He's telling me just how central vegetarian food offerings are to his temple's life. It's the Sunday evening of the festival of Holi and we're standing under the temple's carved stone towers. If festival time come, lots of people came here. And normal time, maybe um, 25,000 people came here to take prasad, to take food. The, the food that is uh, kept once the god has taken his portion. In the first millennium common era, Indian vegetarianism spreads far beyond the fringes of Jainism, Buddhism or the Upanishads. It becomes not just the normal diet of people seeking a spiritual life, but something that even helps you climb the social ladder. This amongst crowds of clashing ideas and borrowed gods, is when vegetarianism permeates Indian society. The question I'll answer this episode is how. Vegetarianism, the story so far with me, E. MacDonald, episode six, Hinduism. When vegetarianism emerged in Iron Age India, it was most strongly associated with the Brahmin caste's free-thinking ascetic rivals called Shramanas, like Buddhists and Jains. And that's where previous episodes about India have focused, but all these traditions are intertwined. Now, the whole history of Indian religion, really, can largely be summed up as a great conversation or argument between Brahminism and the other religions, and both seasides influenced each other. I paid a visit to Oxford University Indologist Richard Gombridge. In his living room in Oxford, he summed up how they interacted over the centuries. The, the Brahmin religion, being very ancient and archaic, from that day to this, has been particularistic. It makes a tremendous difference whether you are male or female, but not merely that, what family you were born into, and only very slowly in the course of this great conversation down the centuries have they moved to the kind of religion which I think we tend more to take for granted based on certain principles. He shall not look at the sun. He shall abstain from eating honey and meat. So this particularistic list of injunctions is usually dated to the middle of the first millennium BCE, the Iron Age, the start of our story. Even when Brahminical animal sacrifice is part of the orthodoxy, when people like the Buddha Gautama are preaching against it, there's the idea that student Brahmins, when they're memorizing the ancient verses of the Vedas, shouldn't eat meat. Taking what is not given, harming animate beings. So roughly when Buddhism and Jainism emerge, there's already an instruction on certain people of one particular gender and one caste at one stage of life to be vegetarian. As opposed to today, where, though there's no hard and fast rule, it's normal for Brahmins to be lifelong vegetarians. No, it depends only on uh, you. On everybody's? Yeah. Everybody's different? Yeah. Uh, some people cannot take uh, non-vegetarian food. Some people cannot take uh, vegetarian food. Hmm? But most of Brahmin people cannot take uh, onion, garlic, and they don't take uh, uh, non-vegetarian food. Hmm. Um, so but uh, time will be changed, everything will be changed, so... But how did this change happen? As the centuries roll on, we can hear the argument unfold in Brahminical scriptures themselves. In the first few centuries of the Common Era, all the proper expectations of human behaviour are collected into a mythical lesson taught by the first human, Manu. Different variations of the laws of Manu are found all over India and even further afield. But even within the same text, contradictory ideas around the rights and wrongs of eating meat jar against each other. You may eat meat that has been consecrated by the sprinkling of water, 
Orwin Brahmin's desire. You can never get meat without violence to creatures with the breath of life. Things inanimate are the food of those endowed with motion, those without fangs of those with fangs, those without hands. Therefore, you should not eat meat. He who even daily devours those destined to be his food commits no sin. The idea that it's acceptable to eat meat consecrated with water, i.e. from a sacrifice, might remind you of ancient Greece. The idea that sacrifice ritualises the status of other animals and makes it okay to eat them is here clashing with the idea of non-violence, ahimsa. Amongst Jain temples north of Delhi, beside the Great Trunk Road that has carried traffic across India for thousands of years, Sanskrit scholar and Brahmin G.C. Tripathi told me not to expect a simple point on the calendar when the Brahmins adopt vegetarianism. It's, it's, it's very difficult that they, they, it is started in a particular century or so. Uh, it, it was a matter of personal taste. Hinduism does not allow, does not disallow anything. He agrees with Richard Gombridge about the reason for this slow trend towards vegetarianism. So, see, Buddhism and uh, Jainism, they uh, exerted a lot of influence upon Hindus, upon uh, those who were following the Vedic religion and Mahabharata for example has a lot of chapters dedicated to vegetarianism and also that one should not sacrifice animals in the sacrifices. India's great drama, the Mahabharata, evolved out of an ancient heroic epic of warring dynasties, of battling gods and demons. There are local variations, a Jain version, and nowadays, of course, several TV versions. By the first millennium, Brahmins are layering on spiritual and philosophical interludes where gods and heroes stop to argue points of principle. By now, Indians are writing on palm leaves and stringing those into books, so different stories and opinions can be literally interleaved. In this episode from the Mahabharata, an abstemious Brahmin ascetic, a Brahminical cousin to Buddhists and Jains, tries to dissuade a priest from sacrificing a goat. Beholding an animal sprinkled with water for sacrifice, a sannyasin spoke to the priest seated there these harsh words. This is destruction of life. This goat will not be destroyed. The animal meets with great benefit if the Vedas are true. His vision will enter the sun. His hearing will cross the horizon. His breath of life will fill the sky. I follow the scriptures and so incur no fault. If you see such good for the goat, then the ceremony is for him. What need do you have for it? Let the goat's family and friends give their approval. Go ask them. The goat's breath of life would return to whence they came. Only the lifeless body would be left. Abstention from cruelty is the highest of all gods. Thus... Teach the elders. Always refrain from cruelty to all creatures is what we praise. We base this on what we can see. We don't rely on what we can't. You take smells from earth, taste from water... And then it goes into an abstruse theological discussion about detachment, which, I'm afraid, the sannyasin and goat both lose. But we can hear the argument for non-violence being made, arguments that increasingly often carry the day. Although the Mahabharata itself is set in a mythical aristocratic world of hunting and meat-eating, it incorporates a sceptical view of their violence. For example, after the final battle at Kurukshetra, the victorious king commands a traditional horse sacrifice, which includes the slaughter of hundreds of other animals. But at the end of it, he's reminded by a half-golden mongoose. Yes, a half-golden mongoose. It is literally a long story that the sacrifice could be outdone by a small gift given them the right spirit. This great sacrifice is not equal to a measure of powdered barley given away by a generous hearted brahmana of Kurukshetra who was observing the vow to live by gleaning. Your personal devotion now matters more than the ostentation of animal sacrifice. And condemnation of Brahminic animal sacrifice also continues to come from the people who started the ball rolling, Buddhists and Jains. Arguments are particularly blunt in South India, with its epics full of miracles and spirits and theological disputations. In this scene from the Buddhist epic man in Mekalai, from Tamil South India in the middle of the first millennium, its boy hero Aputra 
turns on Brahmins angry with him because he tried to stop them sacrificing a cow. She grazes only from the pastures left uncultivated. From the day we are born, out of the kindness of her heart, she nourishes us sweet, excellent milk. Why do you hold such hatred for her? Brahmins, learned in the ancient Vedas, what have you to say? So over time, in most places, it's becoming standard for Brahmins to be vegetarian. And uh, there are some Brahmins, especially living in and around Lucknow, uh, who eat meat, who are allowed, I won't say they are allowed to eat meat, because everything is allowed and everything is disallowed in Hinduism. But they, it was meat eating was more associated with either Kshatriyas Warrior or caste. with the outcast people or uh, the lower most people like Shudras or Chandalas or past they, they are Chandalas? called yeah the, these are the people who kill animals and they eat meat and especially they keep these pigs swine and uh, they they live mostly outside villages. Uh, I mean, at the fringes of the village. Throughout most of history, meat is a scarce commodity. Being able to eat it and share it gives you social standing. This association between meat eating and being low caste or outcast completely turns it upside down, so much that in modern India, advocates for vegetarianism have to disentangle their advocacy from centuries of caste prejudice. The Brahminical rationale for vegetarianism isn't simply ahimsa or non violence. Sanjupta Gupta is Emeritus Professor of Ancient Indian History and Philosophy at Oxford University. And the main idea of the Brahmins saying they are the most important traditionalist is that they are very pure. They lead a pure life. How could you trust the Brahmins to do the rituals properly if they're not leading a pure life? And that gave them the uh, respectable position in the society because they are pure. Vegetarianism is purity. If you have a situation where you are not so very pure inside, like death in the family, then the closest relatives have to become vegetarian to get back the purity. In many places, vegetarianism is simply part of what it means to be a Brahmin. Richard Gombridge. And it's, of course, also... I saw that man having some mutton. He's a low caste. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. Often enforced by village councils. It's been reported to us that Mr. So-and-so, who lives in number 16, <laughs> had mutton for lunch. Mr. So-and-so has pretended to us that he was a middle-caste person, but actually we now realise that he can't be, and from now on we won't recognise him as middle-caste. Because I'm pure vegetarian. I don't eat, eat uh, meat and also onion garlic also. Now I feel, I cannot explain how can I feel. Hmm? And I'm, uh, I'm very um, um, strong. <laughs> Ranjan's Indian pure vegetarianism, without eggs or pungent root vegetables, is quite similar to the Jain diet. But the reason is different. It's a mild diet that's meant to be conducive to a peaceful spiritual temperament. It's got more in common with European monastics than non-violent Jains. More and more, the Ramanical idea of purity influenced the rest of the society. For instance, women folk. They were mostly vegetarian, even when their men folk were not. I can tell you that because my mother was vegetarian, my father was not. <laughs> and so uh, it was because general Hindu idea is purity. Why was it more important for women? Because to keep the purity of the house home. India is the land of a hundred thousand gods. In the first millennium, personal devotion, often to local figures that have nothing to do with that Brahminical high Vedic culture, becomes increasingly important in India's religious life. With help from the concept of reincarnation, minor deities can be incarnations of major ones, they come together. And one of those religions is a vehicle for vegetarianism. At a certain point, difficult to know, the three 
important Hindu gods became very prominent. Shiva, Vishnu and Brahma. Shiva is called the destruction and Brahma is called the creation. Vishnu is protecting. Ranjan is a follower of Vishnu, a Vaishnavite. Vishnu is very peace and they are very vegetarian. So the followers are also following the same line. They are also, the Vaishnavism is a pure vegetarian also. Vishnu's figure is kingly figure with weapon, etc. Why were the Vaishnavas more likely to be vegetarian? The two things very important they wanted. They wanted to climb in the social ladder up and also they wanted to position themselves closer to the ordinary traditional idea of Brahmanism. That would have been prestigious and brought them lots of money. Like the Brahmins, this is also a slow, inconsistent march towards vegetarianism. But whether the earliest Vaishnavas were vegetarian, there is no sign of it, nobody says so. But as it became more sectarian in the end of the first millennium, they started becoming more vegetarianism because somehow they took up the idea of Ahimsa. That the king controls but protects without violence. Ranjan took me inside the temple itself, where pictures around the wall showed what had happened to so many of the local gods and devotional Bhakti cults. Uh, these are kind of paintings in the style of Indian miniatures hanging on the wall. So which incarnations are we looking at? I can see four. Mm, if you come in, you can check, then I can stop. Now you can stand. These are incarnations of Vishnu, starting with Krishna and including a familiar face. So the penultimate one is just a classic image of the Buddha. Buddha speaking is very important. And Buddha speaking is changed all the variety of damage mentality changes. India then, as now, is a melting pot. In South India, the rivalry between the followers of Vishnu, Shiva, Buddha and Jainism is fierce. Ranjan praises the Buddha's teachings. But I met a Vaishnava professor in Madras who told me Vishnu became the Buddha only as a trick to distract the evil people who became Buddhists from getting the benefit of ancient Vedic rituals. The strictly vegetarian Jains don't escape either. In 7th century Tamil South India, the poet saints who celebrate Shiva seem to develop a habit of trolling the Jains. There's even a myth of Jains being massacred in their thousands after losing an argument to a child saint whose verses include Do not listen to the words of the mad Jain monks who wear mats and pluck their hair and eat their food standing. Or this from a fellow follower of Shiva about his past as a Jain monk. I was a deadly snake, dancing to the tunes of evil men, filthy, foul-mouthed. I wandered aimlessly, begging for food, eating with both hands. Truly a wretch. Jains are attacked for the same unworldly, sometimes impractical principles that drive their vegetarianism. And when Jains and Buddhists argue, vegetarianism is a big part of why. For example, in this 10th century Tamil Jain polemic, the demon cum goddess Neela Kechi is sent to deal with a troublesome Jain monk who is interfering with a village sacrifice. But instead, he converts her to Jainism, and she travels from place to place, winning theological arguments on Jainism's behalf, including the claimed hypocrisy of Buddhist meat eating. Buddhist art in the form of painting and sculpture depicts the bodhisattva in different forms of animals and birds. The Buddhists venerate these figures and even offer worship to these as forms of Buddha. Still neither affection nor veneration would stand in their way whenever they desire the flesh of the very same animals and birds for the purposes of eating. 
You might remember from episode two how the early Buddhist rules of discipline described a Jain protest against the Buddha eating meat, which the Buddha allows as long as you don't think the animal was killed for you. That's pretty much the point this Buddhist nun is making to Nila Keiji. It's already dead. The man who kills the animal does not do so for our sake, nor does he commit the crime because of our instigation. He brings the flesh to the open market, not having anybody in view as a special purchaser. Anyone can offer the price and purchase the meat in the open market. Your giving money to purchase meat after the act of killing certainly fixes the responsibility on you because you know very well that the man who sells meat must have obtained only after killing and that he kills the animal for the sake of money which he desires and which he hopes to get from you in exchange for his meat. They're arguing about supply and demand. That modern word Hinduism is an umbrella term for India's religious traditions, particularly when they overlap as well as compete. For example, Professor Tripathi is a Brahmin, He's a devotee of Shiva, and he happily worships at the Jain temple we set outside. We worship Shiva usually. It's our Ishta Devata, but we worship uh, gods, all uh, Vishnu and goddess also. And uh, we come also to this Padmavati temple. And uh, uh, Tripathi told me how Padmavati herself came into Jainism from another strand of Indian religion. Tantra. But uh, later on, under the influence of Tantrism, not only Buddhism but also Jainism, adopted the worship of goddesses and also gods uh, in the form of yakshas. And this goddess is supposed to be a Shakti. This Shakti is a typically Hindu Tantric concept. Just as uh, Buddhists uh, have also Shaktis of, say, Avalokiteshwar, Tara is the Shakti. So this temple is dedicated to Padmavati, who is supposed to be the Shakti, Shakti or energy of Parshanath. Parshanath being a Jain enlightened teacher, a Tathankara like Mahavir. By the way, other strands of the Tantric movement rebel against the vegetarian trend. Tantra has got taboo breaking, meat eating rituals and it influences the meat-eating Buddhism of Tibet. And if you've got an excellent memory, or you're binge listening to this, you might remember the Ajivakas, the mysterious, lost, fatalistic, probably vegetarian religion that emerged from the same Iron Age furnace as Buddhism and Jainism. Their trail peters out this millennium, and they probably melt away into the main pro-vegetarian movements, Jainism and the sect of Vishnu. The other big step forwards for vegetarianism this millennium, probably bigger than the spread of Indian vegetarianism, is the emergence of a more pro-vegetarian Mahayana form of Buddhism. I visited its intellectual heart, the medieval Buddhist Monastery University of Nalanda, with Dr Deepak Anand from its nearby modern namesake. But before we talk about that, I wanted to share a roadside shrine we passed on the way that epitomized for me the Hindu melting pot. So this is, this is a Buddhist deity, uh, Bodhisattva Marichi. You can see on the hairdress, there's a Buddha, Buddha's, Buddha sitting on the headdress. And uh, she is having a, a you know, sword in her hand, uh, right hand. And uh, there are many you know, Buddhist deities, they are flanking this, uh, the central image of uh, Marichi. And they are, you know, pig. Pig, you can there see. Little, no? Lots of little pigs yeah, yeah. below the, 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 the pedestal. So it's this uh, Bodhisattva. So she was built as an image at Nalanda. Do we know how old this particular sculpture is? This is from 10th century. It's over a thousand years old. It was dug up. Any, any idea when? It was lying here in open only. It was it's just lying in a open, open sky. It was in worship by the local people. It was lying in open. I'm standing by. I mean, it's a very, uh, by a completely modern temple, yeah. concrete blocks, iron gates, and there is, uh, and painted on two sides, uh, an advertisement for a brand of underwear. Yeah. It says. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, but this is, uh, and within all that modernity, uh, reincarnated, a thousand year old Buddhist image. Um, recreated, dressed in red cloth and, uh, and gold tapestry as, uh, as a Hindu deity. Yeah. Nowadays there are two broad types of Buddhism. 
Mahayana and Theravada. Mahayana coheres in the second or third century common era. It's more ritualistic, more mythological, as well as more pro-vegetarian. In noisy Delhi University, one Friday afternoon, I talked to Professor K. T. Serawa, head of the Buddhism department, and himself a Mahayana Buddhist. I, as a teacher of Buddhism, very strongly believe that all my degrees from Cambridge and teaching for so many years would be worthless if I end up eating meat. Because meat is accrued by causing hurt and harm to something that is living, which has feelings, which feels pain, which, which misses its young ones. And I have learned this from uh, Buddhism and Jainism. Theravada probably came together a couple of hundred years earlier and, and relies on some of the earliest texts. But Sarawa doesn't agree that that gives it primacy. And uh, one person actually called Mahayana as an export quality Hinduism. But I personally feel that Mahayana was kind of more enlightened, more open, more, more humane. Theravada is more rigid, more kind of disciplined and Mahayana actually seems to have become powerful only on the periphery in India. Uh, let's say Nalanda University in the 6th, 7th century and later was basically in the control of Mahayana. Nalanda's monastery come university is in the old Shramana heartland, perhaps a day's walk from the Mahabodhi tree where the Buddha is said to have achieved enlightenment. They say the Buddha Gautama himself was given the land it was built on. When we stood amongst the massive red brick structures, Dr. Anand described what it would have been like when it was active. You know, but in in its heyday, it was all covered with lime plaster. And on this lime plaster, there was colourful motifs of, you know, Buddhist deities and Buddha. Everywhere it was like, you know, eaves and projections of, you know, stuccos. So it was very colourful and, you know, it was not just red, it was all bright, full of many colours. It's absolutely enormous. Massive temple, 30, 40 metres high, uh, to our left, and more mounds in the distance. This is the temple row, you know, uh, these are the monastery rows, this is the monastery row and this is the temple row. So monks would st- stay here in this monastery row. So many other temples are still buried and many other monasteries are still still buried because the uh, in 12th century, there was another monk scholar who studied here. He says there were 80 monasteries, you know, in Nalanda. In that South Indian Jain polemic you heard earlier, Neela Kechi attacked the Theravada Buddhist idea that it was OK to eat meat as long as the animal wasn't killed, especially for you. But by the 5th century common era, places like Nalanda are discussing a Mahayana text called the Linkavatar Sutra, in which the Buddha Gautama tells his student Mahamati something quite different. Blessed one, even those philosophers who hold erroneous doctrines will prohibit meat-eating and will themselves refrain from eating it. Why not prohibit in his teachings the eating of flesh not only by himself but by others? It is not true, Mahamati, that meat is proper food and permissible for the disciple when not killed by himself, when he did not order the killing, when it was not specially meant for him. Again, Mahamati, there may be some unwitted people in the future time who are in thought evilly affected by erroneous reasonings. In the canonical texts, here and there, the process of discipline is developed in orderly sequence. But in the present sutra, All meat-eating in any form, in any manner and in any place is unconditionally and once and for all prohibited for all. Thus, Mahamati, meat-eating I have not permitted to anyone. I do not permit. I will not permit. Lankavtar Sutra mentions over two dozen reasons as to why Buddha could not have condoned meat eating and why it is sinful to eat meat or to sanction meat eating. In detail they talk about it. When you read that, one clearly gets the impression that this must have been a very serious issue. I'm standing with Deepak Anand in a a small tall chamber of very old bricks. Where are we? 
this is one of the uh, monastic cells of ancient Nalanda remains and uh, this monks would stay here you know and uh, this was the uh, place where they would stay this monk cells would be allotted to monks you know depending upon their uh, seniority every year they were allotted fresh uh, monk cells and uh, probably this was uh, on a shared basis three or four monks would share each cell it's pretty small yeah, yeah. what were the monks here eating Monks, uh, you know, uh, Venerable Xuanzang, the Chinese monk scholar from China, he, if, uh, in the 7th century he was here and he said that, you know, every day they were uh, given you know, some buttermilk, rice, or, and, and some other uh, local fruits and vegetables it was offered to him. Since they were monks, so, you know, they, did, they didn't have lots of fancy food. Nalanda is at the heart of a network of Mahayana Buddhism that reaches into Central Asia and China. And that's one of the trails we're going to follow next episode. So why did Mahayana Buddhism become vegetarian? Obviously, Katie Saroa and other Mahayana Buddhists put it down to Ahimsa. After all, the principle of non-violence has been at the heart of Buddhism since the beginning. The Lankavata Sutra hints at their being shamed into it by philosophers who hold erroneous doctrine but compassionate practice. Would that be the Jains or someone else? Richard Gombridge. By the time that the Mahayana moved to China, which began in the 2nd century AD, but even then on a very small scale, really only got going in the 3rd century AD, and that, you know, is more than half a millennium after the Buddha, by that time, the Buddhists were trying to keep up with the Brahmins. What did that mean? The Brahmins had introduced into their myriad of rules, rules about purity in cuisine, what you were and were not allowed to eat. Broadly, they excluded meat-eating. And then they said, you Buddhist monks have a very, very impure diet. We, of course, don't eat this nasty stuff that you will eat. When Buddhism got to China, Buddhism had this Brahminical tinge to it, that Buddhist monks were not supposed to eat any meat, and that is the case to this day. Which country? Bhutan. Bhutan. I'm from Na Mumbai. Mumbai. Uh, Bhutan. When I visited the Mahabodhi Temple for episode two, I asked pilgrims where they were from. Buddhism has spread across the world. Where are you from? Which country? Um, I'm from Vietnam. I live in USA. From Burma. In episode four, Ashoka helped spread Buddhism throughout India. But it's in the first millennium that it spreads throughout Asia, Theravada Buddhism taking the southern route into Southeast Asia and Mahayana Buddhism going north. You know, monks and scholars from here who used to go, they were also Dhammadutas. Like, you know, they, were, they, were, uh, they would go and, you know, they would try to you know, convince people about, you know, the uh, Buddhism, the good aspects of the Buddhism. The Dhamma warriors, the warriors for, for, for Dharma, the, the, Dhamma, the, the, yeah, the they, Buddhist they would, code. They would go and preach the teachings of the Buddha. Next episode, we discover how vegetarianism fares across Eurasia, from the heretics of Christendom to the Buddhist emperor of China. With the music of Rob Masters, the voices of Chetan Patak, Selvarasa Lingam and Sandeep Goucher. Please follow on Facebook and Twitter.com slash vegan option and find out more at veghist.org. If you like the series, and I'm guessing you do if you've listened this far, please do get the word out. Review on iTunes or your podcast provider. Share it on Twitter or on Facebook. Embed the SoundCloud player in your blog and tell your friends. It's taking me many months of unpaid work, so please do spread the word if you think it's worth it. And thank you very much for listening.